Welcome to the CIM Marketing Podcast. The contents and views expressed by individuals in the CIM Marketing Podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the companies they work for. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hello everybody, welcome to the second, as James said, live CIM Marketing Podcast and the 81st CIM podcast has started at the end of our fourth season. So this is our season uh, closer. Um, we were back in September for season number five, quite remarkable. And Ali and I, she sat over there, started it all those years ago. It's been going strong. Quick advert from me. We have now had 130,000 downloads. If you give me 800, so just short of 130,000 downloads. And we have 5,000 regular subscribers on Spotify alone, a similar number on Apple Podcasts, and around all of the platforms we go out on, around 10,000 subscribers. So it's been a really enjoyable project, um, exciting. We've had some fantastic guests, and none better than the two gentlemen we are joined by today. Mr. Ryan Miles, who is from one of the biggest names in business, Microsoft. He's Director of International Integrated Marketing there. How are you, sir? I'm good. Thank you for having me again. Great to have you, great to have you on the show. And Mr. Vincent Sider, who is CEO of Get Inference and is also a course director at CIM here, specialising in artificial intelligence, which, as James is saying, is what we're going to be focusing on today. It's something that I think everybody is interested in, so we'll find out more about from the guys who know. Um, before I started, a lady asked me if I ever get nervous about podcasts. I do them so frequently now, I don't get nervous as such, but I do get a little bit nervous about one thing when we've got a live podcast, is that when we get to the Q&A at the end, is I want to see a forest of hands, or people be, be enthusiastic to be the first person to ask a question. We're going to get 20 minutes at the end, so all of those things have been bugging you or grating you or eating away at you about AI that you want to know. Try and get your question in. We'll try and get as many in as we can. We're going to move 20 minutes at the end of the show uh, to take Q&A Q from the audience. But before we get there, we've got 40 minutes of discussion with these two gentlemen. And we're going to start with you, Ryan, about if you could take us through some of the emerging technologies that you're starting to see specifically or mainly in the marketing and business landscape from AI. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's definitely a transformational moment. There's been lots of transformation in recent history. We've had the cloud and um, before that, the, the web, the internet, and now AI is, is really on the level of that. It's, and we're at the beginning of the journey. And I think probably the way that most people have experienced natural, natural language models and, and AI is through chat. Yep. Chat GPT is yeah. something I think most in the room will be familiar with and hopefully listening to the podcast um, at Microsoft, we have a partnership with OpenAI and we have ChatGPT enabled uh, Bing for search. And I think that's one of the key places we're seeing this really play out is as, as consumers, as marketers, as professionals, uh, as learners interacting with this new tool. Um, we've seen data that of the 10 billion searches that, that we see uh, every day, up to half of them go un, unanswered. We don't get the actual outcome we're looking for. And that was because search evolved pretty naturally. Google did some really impressive things from the get-go, but we've evolved. And chat and AI is just bringing this new platform that really kind of gets conversational, goes deeper, looks beyond single sources of information. I think that's one area we're really excited about and, and is evolving quickly for how we use it day to day. That's an interesting figure, isn't it? That 50% figure, because you sort of think that sort of search solved everything. You know, it killed the encyclopedia, it killed, it killed sort of asking your uncle or a clever aunt what the answer of something was. But it hasn't killed everything. It, it got us half the way there. Mm. Um, and there's, a, there's a still a gap of 50%. And that's where the new technologies are coming in, you're saying, to help fill that gap. Absolutely. I think that's the most pervasive. But then it gets much more specific. You know, we're seeing the power of language, uh, text to image text to video so that idea of I don't think we necessarily thought of AI as being the place where creativity comes to life that it augments it yeah. uh, but that's definitely been a hot button area for the fast development ab above uh, we've got Dali again from the open AI team and our own work at Microsoft but you've got so many different platforms now that you can do just absolutely stunning things uh, and there's different comfortability around the world in different countries and different markets with what that kind of synthetic media 
uh, how, how we feel about that when we're looking at someone that maybe never existed is totally generated looking back at us through the screen. So I think that's another really interesting touch point and so important to marketers because you know, the, the core of our job is creativity to build brands and to solve customer problems. So what, what, what brought you in? To it, um, Vincent. Was it the creativity side? Was it, was it the helping people? Or something else? What, what, what oh, it, it, it came before that. As, as a kid, I mm. got fascinated by how the brain works. Mm. And uh, as an adult, the proxy to understand how the brain works is to understand how we understand AI. So I got into that from a, a neuroscience point of view, but then became hooked with AI because of a piece of work I did at the BBC to understand audiences a bit better and at that point become acquainted with techniques like machine learning and clustering that give you a way to have a data-driven uh, opinion on what your audience looks like. And in the world of Top Gear, this is especially important because you can't have an opinion on Top Gear audiences with the brand. It has to be data-driven. So AI became almost like a life savior because I could have a conversation and, and, and prove uh, my point with data. That's how I, become, I became hooked with AI, and then realized that it, 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 it goes way beyond uh, clustering. It goes into predictive modeling, where you can use AI to predict the behaviors of audiences going forward, whether it's, are they, are they going to click, are they going to watch, are they going to buy, how much are they going to generate. So as a CMO, uh, this uh, insight is uh, it's fantastic. It's like the holy grail of marketing, really. It's, an, it's almost an entirely positive testament that you give. You, 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 you don't see any, you see major opportunities from it, from little threats, as other people see. Absolutely. Uh, threat, threat from it, <laughs> rightly, rightly or wrongly. But you, you've seen it from a young age as an opportunity, as an exciting technology, which augments and it actually sort of sustains what you are trying to say to exactly. people. You're able to, you're able to cite the data and get the evolution across. Do you think, at least for, more for you, Ryan, but for both of you to some degree, will it ever get faster and grow so much that it actually does justify some of the fears around it, that it, that it gets out of control? I mean, it is. It's fast-moving and it's transformative in so many ways, as I was, I was mentioning before. It's right to approach it with care and mm. think carefully, and I think as much as the technology being a risk, it's, it's how we deploy it as well. At Microsoft, we're very conscious of responsible AI, uh, and that's not just how it's built, how it's trained, but how it's deployed and how it's implemented. And you know, we definitely perceive uh, AI as a big opportunity uh, done the right way, really as a co-pilot. This is not a, 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 a mm. tool that runs away with you, but something that helps you get more efficient and more effective uh, and spend more time doing those, those uh, creative, difficult thinking jobs um, and, and away from some of the mundanity of, of work and life. You're laughing there, Vincent. Is that because you agreed or you disagreed? No, because I'm just preempting the next uh, <laughs> point, which is <laughs> we do have a product called Copilot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, no, I, I think the branding is spot on. I think the what it conveys as a message of what AI is about is also spot on. So, yeah, that's, that's why I'm smiling. So a co-pilot that augments and helps us, and certainly evidence from the testimonies earlier, is, is that is indeed the case. And a lot of people who have used AI, to, AI tentatively or in a little way so far, marketers and otherwise, are finding that it is helping them and it is saving, saving them time. Not all of it has worked, though, has it? There has been some blunders. There's been some missteps. There have been technologies that have been touted as the next best thing and have turned out to be nothing of the sort. Any particular examples you can think of? In 2006, I joined BT, and I learned that BT in 2000, they had a virtual world proposition. Believe it or not, like a virtual world. Virtual world. Yeah, yeah. like Second Life, right? Before Second Life. And then came Second Life, and uh, we spent a year to find out how to invest into virtual world, just to realize a year later that this was just not catching up with the audience, right? And then you had the uh, Google Glasses in 2014 that became a thing for a year until people realized that if you were to wear your Google Glasses in pubs, you would get attacked by people because <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't want you to be <laughs> recording them, right? Uh, and then you had the Oculus Rift, which uh, became a fantastic tool if you had the right PC, the right cables, and the right uh, <laughs> applications, uh, but also uh, fell flat and, and, and was revised with the Quest 2. Um, so I, I think as soon as you touch, you know, this, this concept of virtual reality, virtual worlds, 
and the headset that uh, accompanied this this uh, this concept then you are in the G territories and so far history hasn't proved that there is a market for this mm. so uh, very very um, interested to see development of meta in that space and and how they're going to pivot from from now on but yeah i mean the, some things is, is it easy to predict what's going to be a flop and what's going to work in this space? I mean, I, I looked at the Vision Pro from Apple. And got Apple everything, as you can see. Sorry, Ryan. Um, that, to me, looks like a, an expensive flop in the making, isn't it? It's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> try and pick this one. How many times have we thought it's the moment of, yeah. of VR and headsets? Yeah, exactly. I, look, there, definitely, as, as a marketeer, personally, there's going to be a place for it. For sure, I mean, the power of gaming when these things catch up and the technology's there, um, it will certainly become a very interesting pom proposition. I think there's some very interesting discussion as well about <coughs> virtual reality versus augmented reality mm. versus wearables and what it means to interact with the real world, which is very mainstream. Everyone is comfortable with that. That's how we experience things versus this other layer and that other layer that potentially blocks it or a layer that lets you see through it. And, yep. and builds on it. And we do a lot um, through, through Microsoft HoloLens uh, where we see really fantastic commercial applications um, it, where an ability where if you have something that's incredibly difficult or expensive to train someone on in the medical industry, yep. you, you know, exactly. practicing on bodies on, on, a, on an operating table, it's pretty dangerous. But using things like augmented reality can really create opportunities there to do things at scale that otherwise aren't possible. Are the things that have tended to succeed so far, the things that have allowed you to see more of the world than as it is, rather than create new worlds? Exactly, yes. That seems to me that, you know, if we're creating a software, a, a, as you say, an alternative world, you mentioned the BT, alternative word on the second life, versus things that have able you to dive deeper in the world as it is around us, for practical and for leisure reasons, as you mm. mentioned, the medical, medical industry, and I think that that sort of takes us on to what marketers can use it for, isn't it? We're not as marketers wanting to create new worlds and fictions for our audience. We are trying to create for our audience um, a better, clearer understanding of the world, again, the world we're in and the products we're trying to sell or, or promote. I think definitely. I, I d also see the, the interest in the realm of, of virtual worlds. And I think, again, AI is going to help this move along at a rapid rate because of the capability of it to generate these worlds. If you're talking virtual, it's severely limited by your ability to create. Yeah. Uh, you've yeah. got to look at the success of Roblox and those kind of things. Uh, incredibly powerful. We just haven't changed the mode in which we experience it. And that's right on the, on the doorstep. We're working with Oculus and Meta on things like better virtual meetings. You know, in a hybrid workspace, it can be pretty isolating looking through a screen. But having some kind of other realm that makes you feel at least semi there and interacting and turn around in a room, that's going to be immensely powerful and, and important maybe to mental health as it relates yeah. to work, all kinds of things. So I, I don't think it's one or the other. It's applications, and as different technologies catch up, we'll have different use cases for each. Do you think we've become more open to it? You know, if ChatGPT or DALI were, were sort of launched five years ago, do you mm -hmm. think the response would have been as open to the idea as it is now? It probably would have been a little bit more jarring. Yeah. It's over time things you know build up. I mean, it's it's, it's not that long ago everyone was talking about the cloud and they're like, what is the cloud? What do you mean my things are here, there, nowhere, and everywhere all at the same time? Uh, and I don't know how many people truly understand the technical aspects even of the cloud today. But they're very comfortable with the idea. You know, whether you have a OneDrive or a Google Drive or a good old Dropbox. But, and access on all devices, and we've become a very multi-device society, particularly in the Western world. Um, and I think those things build up to this, and now it's not a huge jump, the idea that you can... And, and search, you know, did, hey, we send it in, we get results, and we explore. Now you get all the results, and someone figures them out for you and tells you kind of the synopsis of that. So it's been a progression. If you skip any of those steps, I think, of course, it's, it's a bit more jarring. Do you think that there are some technologies that have been around for a while that we just weren't using? We're now starting to be, become more accepted. We're, we're, we're starting to accept more. We've become more conditioned to them. We're getting the most out of technologies that have been around for a while. I think AI is a good example because it's been... I mean, AI started in 1943, right? 1943. With the first computer, yeah. Ah. Uh, neural networks were defined in 1944, 1945. In fact, they were used... In fact, that technology, the, the machine learning technology was used to spot enemy ships in the channels. Clustering, right? 
um, and then Turing, uh, of course, as you, as you know, uh, was instrumental in this. But I think AI is a good example because until this moment of generative AI, which happened in November, um, people were not really engaging with AI. Suddenly, you add a chat uh, user experience to it. And suddenly, you have 100 million people hooked in two weeks. And then 1 billion point six people active in, in six months, right? Yeah. So, yes, there is, there is a, a road uh, that, that proved the contrary, which is, which is AI. And, and, I, and I think it's down to the UX of, of, yeah, of the user experience. So if we can use it, we can use it, as you say, it's, it's, it, it, I hesitate to use the word craze, it seems almost to trivialise it, but ChatGTP has a lot of, was a lot of le leisure users jumping on it and creating this exponential growth mm. curve, so suddenly everybody, or nearly everybody it seems, is using it, or is using it for something, for fun or otherwise. But it does beg the question, if we can get that sort of a exponential acceptance of a new technology very quickly... For our leisure purposes in our homes, in our personal lives, we can probably see similar adoption rates in our business lives. What do you think are going to be the key technologies that will have a, the biggest impact on us in the next two or three years as marketers? <laughs> I have to pitch for AI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's going, to be, it's, going to be a, it's going to be the dominant tool for the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, We've just crossed the threshold with generative AI and people start to realize the impact that AI can have in, 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 ma in the marketing space and it's going to get exponential from there. It's going to get exponential in terms of what AI can do, in terms of what AI can automate, in terms of what AI can actually collaborate with other AI to automate. We are going into a world where AI will operate in swarms and will be specialized to do marketing tasks that will not even need our uh, inputs. So I think this we are does that not does not, not remove the role of some. It does not, be, and I'm going to use the same keyword of copilot, right? Mm. If if you ask people, uh, you're going to board that plane and you have two choices. First choice is you pay less but you have no pilot, mm. and second choice you pay a bit more but you have a pilot. Which which choice <laughs> are you going to make? I'll pay more. We need responsibility, okay. right? Yeah. We, we, at, at the end of the day, we need responsibility for the actions, and also uh, we need to guide the system, because even though it looks intelligent, it's still stupid. It still predicts. An outcome, uh, it doesn't think, it doesn't reason, really reason, although it's going to be cracked in the next five years. But the human element is still important to control, to, to, to act responsibly with the output, and to guide the system where we want the system to go, right? So in that sense, our job, are not, I, if, if anything, we are going to be needing more of humans than, 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 than before. More, <laughs> human, more humans rather than humans. Yeah, I, I, more I, marketers. I agree with, with all of what Vincent said there. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's a tool to be used as mm. part of our wider toolkit. I think you still need to be... Anything we've learned, you know, large language models have created a very accessible way to gain access. AI has been around for ages, uh, as we noted. And in very much in our everyday lives, particularly in marketing, the algorithms that decide what we see and when we see it, who gets targeted how we build campaigns, all that's been around for a while now. That's not new news. How we access and interact with it, that's what's changed with large language models. And you really need to know what to ask, how to ask it, and then how to guide it once it starts responding to get anything out of it. I mean, we see a lot, anyone who, who follows socials or, or the various influences around AI, you know, the idea of prompt engineers. You see these yep. job, job listings. Uh, very hard for me to prompt a large language model to do great video production if I know nothing about video production. Yeah, I have yeah. no idea yeah. what to ask. Exactly. So yeah. there will be a moulding new skills built onto existing expertises. And I think that's, you know, if we pull this back to, to marketing specifically, how marketing leaders need to think about this. Where can I integrate it to cut my costs in half, potentially, or my time to market by a factor of 10? And then what do I do with that? You know, your resources are the same. It doesn't, the hours in the day don't change. Goals for growth and your opportunities, so you can just get far more efficient and you can redeploy that human capability in new and very creative or strategic ways to kind of accelerate your growth in whatever vector, whatever angle you want. I think that's, that's the exciting part. That's how you have to tackle the, the, the opportunity, uh, but take a measured approach. And there's going to be tools for everything. The positive, prim the positive prim prism to look through is it's a bit like the Industrial Revolution in that it removed a lot of the mundane work, a lot of the routine work, and allowed people to do more quality work, add mm. more value. Um, as a marketer yourself, actually at the sort of vanguard of this mm -hmm. stuff, how have you seen your own role change so you've reduced doing some of the more mundane routine stuff in, in, in 
do more of the you know, interesting I, stuff. I, I love these tools. I use you being a lot just for quick research, like dip sticking, dip mm. sticking on things as you kind of every day you kind of confronted with a conversation or an opportunity that you you're not as formed as you could be. So instead of spending potentially a couple of hours searching, looking for for different sites, sources of information. That can kind of happen in a matter of minutes before you walk into a meeting. And then that meeting can be infinitely more productive because you're starting on a better knowledge base with the expert you're working with. And that could be someone in your team, could be a partner, a, a stakeholder. Uh, I think that's been a really powerful application that's, that's a really low hurdle. Like you don't mm. have to put sensitive information in it or anything like that. It's just this awesome partner to go in and, and prepare yourself with. We're still uh, at the early stages of playing with things like, um, you know, for, for us, it, it's being creates, but DALI and image creation and how to build that into our marketing models. How do we uh, expand our creative capabilities for things like campaigns? We're doing a lot of work actually in our tooling for our clients. So predictive analytics, um, yep. optimizations in campaigns, things like that. A lot of what Vince was saying in terms of taking time out. So you just provided with the recommendations. One favorite I, I love, which is a bit of a shameless plug, I was on holidays recently. I came back and uh, Teams has this new function with AI where it notes anytime your name is mentioned in a meeting that you're included on, even if you weren't there. And I came back every time my name had appeared in any meeting oh. uh, that I'd been invited to that I'd missed that week was there with all the notes, the context and all that kind of thing. <laughs> infinitely sped up my ramp up back into work nice. because I didn't have to go chase that stuff down and yeah. I kind of had it and you oh, I need to go talk to so about that because I'm absolutely not touching that <laughs> or you know hey I, I need to get onto that I didn't know that was such a big issue so cool little things like that I didn't even know it was there I came back to the office and I was like wow this, we were talking pre-pod there was a there's a lot of time wasted in business necessarily wasted you could say if there is such a thing as necessary waste in transition those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. When someone's transiting from one place to another, mm. they're coming back from holiday, they're catching up, they attend, they're trying to get notes from a meeting which, to which they were unable to attend, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is, which is glorified admin. And what you're saying is this is going to take a lot of that out of our lives. Absolutely. Right. And so it's a very positive message. And yet, and yet, I still hear a lot of fear and worry from marketers, particularly at the junior level, that it will take out some of the jobs in the creative industries. It will start to dismantle some opportunities, particularly at the lower levels of the industry. It is going very, moving very quickly. So can, to some degree, I can understand those fears. Is there any truth in it? Is there anything to be worried about? Part is true, part is... Part is uh, just fear. Um, so, what's fear is, and, and this is common to all these big major technical shifts, right? From, uh, let's say, uh, the moment we had the internet to uh, the moment that we are now witnessing AI in, in reality in our lives. Um, there is actually a group in the US called the Pessimist Archive Group that lists all of these moments in time. And, and <laughs> the and Pessimist the Archive Pessimist Group. Archive groups, and they, they show the the paranoia uh, of the time because of the introduction of this technology and, and, and they document this and, and, and they, show, they show the impact on, on behaviors and so on. But long story short, um, if anything, I think it's going to be a golden age for creative because AI will help you know, writers, filmmakers, video game designers and so on to accelerate their job and to go far beyond what they had in mind originally. Uh, for people, for, for the one, one Ben marketer, it is going to become a super uh, jack of all trades, you know, mm. with the ability to create uh, image and videos with little resources at the level of professional, you know, um, companies. So this part is, I think, is is uh, I think now is, is acknowledged. So what what is not true? Are we going to lose jobs? Maybe in the short term, not in the long term, right? And I have to discuss about this from a macro level point of view. I can't discuss this from an opinion point of view. At a macro level point of view, you're more productive. Therefore, your cost of goods uh, or services goes down. Yeah. Therefore, you can uh, innovate uh, with new products and new services, which requires a new task force. So the, the, the job you lose on legacy, you create with new product and experiences. Yeah. So from a job creation point of view, at macro level, this is not going to happen, right? Mm. But it's about being agile and, and adapt, adaptable. Yeah. That, that part is, 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 uh, is not true. The part of um, inequality, let's say, um, is true and not true. It's, 
inequality will be created for companies or, or systems that refuse AI. So you, the world is now on that, on that train, blocking AI in, in, in different sectors, in, with regulations or in different companies, departments, is like shooting yourself in the foot yeah. because you can't compete anymore, right? Yeah. So the inequality will come because of not using AI. The inequality could arise for uh, roles that uh, you can't really upskill very well. BT has made an announcement that they are not going to replace 10,000 roles uh, going forward because they are going to use AI to replace these roles. So if I was in these people's shoes, I would think of a way to upskill myself and look in different areas than these roles because I know they are doomed. Um, the part which is true is the part about how AI uh, could arm society. Yes, it could arm society, but uh, just like uh, using Photoshop to create fake pictures of people, arm society, right? Mm. Just it's easier to do it. But AI is also the solution. Because if you can use AI to fake people and voices and pictures and so on, you can also use AI to, to find out what's been faked. For the forensics. Yeah. For the forensics, for instance. So I think there is a lot of paranoia. I think, I think the, the, the real issue is about how bad actors will use this. But AI is the solution for that. So it's interesting, to pick up on an earlier point you made, it's really interesting testimony, but I write for a business magazine, um, not kind of Catalyst, for a university, and a lot of the concentration in a lot of the topics in that magazine is about how leaders and senior teams move between what they call exploitation and exploration. Mm -hmm. And exploitation is, it sounds like a nasty word, it's not. It's just the core part of your business, the serving your regular customers the main, the bring in the main revenues. And what, that, what tends to happen in most businesses is most leadership teams and most senior C-suite people and senior people in the business, everyone in the business to some extent, gets, always gets pulled back to the core. And the exploration gets less and less. Unless you're a very big company with huge amounts of resources, your exploration is a sort of poor relation. What you're saying is with AI, that exploration window will open up because there is, there is the, the draw to the core isn't as strong. You're taking me back to my MBA strategies for growth lecture right there. I remember the principles very well. Um, yeah. Look, businesses oscillate between those. Good ones will recognise yeah. when they have a proposition to exploit and when that competitive advantage is diminishing and they need to go back to exploration. That is what great leadership teams do and, and see before everyone else does. That, that requires incredible vision as a leadership group. With AI, I think it makes some of that more possible, more regularly at, at lower cost. But I think it comes down to, as we were saying, having great people who know how to use the tools really well. I think one really exciting element of AI is how it's going to help and support small businesses or small and medium businesses access the type of uh, outputs that before required huge capital investments or, or professional service costs that they just couldn't have, that mm. limited their ability to, to do exploration yeah. uh, as a business. And uh, we know that SMBs are so important to the backbone of the economy, for GDP growth, for job creation, for all these really important things. And when we can inject innovation there, now AI is not cheap to create or fund. I'm sure we've all heard about GPU shortages and the intensive load it places on a, you know, particularly a handful of companies that, that kind of are the backbone of this infrastructure. But for the end users, it's incredibly cheap and accessible in its current guise. And I think the, the thing we haven't touched on so much just yet, but is coming in the evolution, is data. Mm. And these unique data sets. Now, the most large language models we're all referencing and using and playing with at the moment are big, broad, collective ones, web scraping and those kind of things. Many will have heard of, of Elon's change to, to Twitter about some of this stuff as well. Um, but as we start taking those, largely trained models and then injecting walled garden, very specific data sets, then you're really harnessing the power of where this goes. And that becomes very interesting for specific applications in specific contexts uh, in whatever business you are in. Yep. Uh, that, that's really kind of interesting and probably where we see the next step go in, in the not too distant future of how people are applying this, particularly in business and, and marketing as a well. whole. So in order to occupy that space, Vincent, in order to make sure as marketers, if we accept your analysis, which sounds to me like a sound analysis, which is a generally positive trend, it's 
going to take a lot of the boring stuff off our hands, frankly. It's going to take the routine stuff off our hands, allows more time and space to be creators. In order so you can make sure you're in that space as an explorer, in that space as a creator or a guider, what do you as a marketer need to do in order to make sure you're there and not in a bit that's going to be taken over by AI? Uh, educate yourself. Because the space is moving so fast, it's almost overwhelming. Educate yourself. Continuous learning uh, is, is advice number one. And, and I'm grateful for, for the team to have actually released and, uh, these five courses because they're going to be helpful for the industry. Um, and my personal advice is also to build. This is contrary to the, uh, you know, uh, counterintuitive. Because as marketer, we're not engineers, right? Yeah. But, but yeah. having a project at the weekend, at, in the evening, to build with AI, it's so easy now to build stuff with large language model. So that's the, that's the way to really grasp what this is about. You could, you could build, for example, example, I built an application to audit my YouTube videos' comments and make a decision whether I should reply or not. And the reply is actually written by the, the large language model. And the nuance and, and the reasoning for the reply is, is spot on. Yeah. AI will not engage in comments which are political, for instance. I didn't make that choice. AI made that choice. To build this application took me four hours. You understand how to prompt. You understand how to uh, manipulate a large language model by building. So compound this with the learning you do on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, and through professional um, courses like the SIM courses, then you have a way forward to really adopt AI in your organization, in your career, and also understand the right question to ask, that's the problem, the right tool to use, so many, that's the way forward. Yeah. How quick do you have to be about it? Do you get yourself educated? How, how, so, how you know, soon? Luckily, there is something called ChatGPT, and soon something maybe called Copilot from Microsoft, maybe. <laughs> and these things, uh, they level the playing field. I didn't code. Uh, for 20 years. I'm an engineer already, but I didn't code, right? Mm. It took me uh, a day to get back uh, up to speed just by asking ChatGPT to help me code. And this is why I could do that stuff in four hours. So if, if you have the will, you have the, there is a way. And ChatGPT is your best tutor, your best coach for whatever you want to do. So there is now a moment in time where we are leveling the playing field. There is probably a window of opportunity of two years for people to basically deliver what they want to deliver from marketing point of view, from product point of view, before the competition get up to speed and it, it becomes much more expensive. So, yeah. Two, two, two years, Ryan. You, you, of course, have to be at the cutting edge because you work for, <laughs> you work for Microsoft. How have you made sure that your team are ahead of even that two-year curve? I think we're in the, I don't know if it's the fortunate or unfortunate position sometimes, <laughs> but, yeah, part of this are our products. So as yeah. we come to terms with what is in our organization and try and keep pace with our own engineering org who are developing these things, we're, we're kind of, our hand is forced. Uh, and it can, it's not always easy, but it's certainly a long-term benefit of, of being in that position. But I yeah, very much agree with Vince, playing with this stuff. And it can do so much more than kind of you're thinking your day-to-day. -day. So it, your imagination is the opportunity there. Build, build a website just through natural language, right? pretty cool thing to do but to start with but then you have something for it like it can just be uh, a hobby project but that's going to be really useful as you go back into the workplace and then try and do something and I think per particularly for for those early in career I had a really interesting mm. conversation um, with a founder at, at, at the uh, Festival of Creativity in Cannes a couple of weeks ago and he was mm. talking to me what he's doing with his business with thousands of employees totally reorganized it and every pod that he's organized now has an AI ambassador. Mm. That role didn't like, exist what, weeks, months ago. Yeah, six months a ago. And now yeah. they're, they're operating in these pods of, of various types of experts in their field, videographers, creatives, designers, illustrators, and helping them use the tools as the conduit, the bridge between the tools and their expertise and, and kind of upskilling them and, and, and getting the potential uh, out of this tool. So I think we keep coming back to this theme that it is a tool. And in the hands of the right person with the right skill set is incredibly powerful, yeah. but you need to merge the new skills of how to use it with the actual expertise of what you're trying to achieve. And I think as we, we talk about what opportunities come up, that's, that's where to position yourself. Someone with an expertise and the ability to use, you're going to be in a really solid place. And I think you'll really quickly build new expertise in new areas because you can 
teach yourself how to build stuff that you otherwise couldn't without these. That that is the exciting part of it. But when we will it transform education itself? There'll be more self learning, more self teaching. Will the roles for course creators, course directors? Well. There will be uh, AI tutor for sure. Right. They are going to be kinder. They are going to have more patience. <laughs> they are going to be personalized, right? Yeah. They are going to address Vincent, Ben, yeah. um, not uh, a class. Yeah. Um, personalization, I think, is the key word here. Right? It's going to be uh, my own custom journey to learn this, uh, this what I want to learn. Uh, and, and vice versa, it's going to help the teachers do better. There is a research from the Bracknam Young University, which I love to, um, to talk about, which demonstrate that um, using AI as a panel for surveys is the same thing as using humans. AI responds the same way. This was just uh, validated by a research from uh, Entropic Cloud, another large language model, last week, that shows that when you ask um, at, at global level very important social questions to AI, AI pretending to be you know, citizens of the UK or France or, or the US, the reply would be the same as the population in aggregates. Right. So you can use AI to simulate your students. Just like, back to marketing, because we haven't really touched about marketing yet, mm -hmm. just like you can use AI to simulate your audience. So you can use AI to yeah. test your creative, to, to predict your click-through rates, to behave just like uh, your consumer, your, your customers. This is proven research, right? So yes, it's going to transform education, both sides. Uh, maybe for us as trainers, it's gonna, we, we'll become facilitator instead of the provider of content, because the content you will get from ChatGPT. But the facilitator in terms of where to look, what tool to use, how to use it. Um, there is something, though, that AI won't teach, which is how to trust AI. Mm. Uh, and that's the most important uh, topic. Uh, we'll probably get some questions on that. Yeah. In a <laughs> okay, so I'm going to stop there then. But for me, <laughs> this is the key subject, yeah. is the trust. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What about when you're recruiting? I mean, trying to hiring people is the job of anyone who's above the sort of low, the lowest level in an organisation. The hiring people is probably the diff most difficult job, the most time-consuming job for most people. Quite, can be quite a painful job. Are we going to get AIs who can find us the best candidate? And, and that's think? the lowest hanging fruit for AI. That's that's really? where AI will shine, right? It's already the case with with pinpoint, for instance, based in Jersey. I'm from Jersey right now, and um, so uh, CV screening, okay. Uh, the, the reduction of uh, bias, uh, discrimination, mm -hmm. um, the uh, skills assessment, um, all of these things will be managed by AI. And from the candidate point of view, the user experience, yesterday I did um, a review on a tool called AI interview mockup, whereby you upload your job description uh, or you select a template and the AI trainer will help you practice your interview before the interview and we'll give you grade and so on and give you feedback. Um, so it's going to work both ways. It's going to help the candidates optimize the way they pitch uh, and, and, and fulfill a role and it's going to help the recruiter uh, do it faster and hopefully uh, with more accuracy. That is if the model that has been used has been uh, trained in the right way, which is another topic, right? So, Ryan, if you use this stuff positively, if you get ahead of it, if you understand it, you can get a better job in a bigger industry for a better company. You can hire better people. You can learn quicker. Sounds great. Is there anything bad about it? Um, I think it's how it's implemented. That's a big question. And, and the trust in it. How do your consumers in whatever industry you feel about using it, how does, how does your team, how do those around you, your family, like um, Vincent mentioned before, like there is going to be resistance for this. And, and rightfully so. You need the counterweight to these arguments. It can't all be one direction. And it's, we're at the beginning of this. Like There mm. is going to be lots of missteps. And you know, we have, chatbots have been around for a while. And yet most of them have not done particularly well no, when, when put up to a test. And there's been learnings in that. How many times you let... You know, we can goad AI into doing certain things if you don't kind of put stops in there. And people are clever. You put one stop in, they find another way, and there's people that want to see it fail. So mm. I, I think it'd be remiss of us to think that, that counter-arguments are not, A, a good thing, and, and B, absolutely fundamental to the overall improvement and benefit of it. And it, it just keeps coming back to you know, how we build, how we implement, how we use, use, and that whole idea of responsible AI being really important. But definitely, those who take a, a positive mindset towards it and good intent. I think all of those things you listed. And the other thing is create things that don't exist yet. Like yeah. just 
start from scratch and use it as this tool to explore and walk your imagination and have a, a, something there can help you build it. Stop chasing minutes for when meetings you didn't attend and build something interesting and new. I love this idea, um, again, something I heard out of, of Can that I thought was a lovely way to, to speak about it, was decoupling the idea of time and output. Yeah. AI just totally separates those two ideas, and we've got so much, particularly in the creative and the marketing industries, the idea that you charge for time instead of output. And if everything gets faster and, and more robust and, and deeper, but we have this... Then it's it's about the output. It should have always been about the output, but we lacked a better thing than time, and, and this is going to really disrupt that. I think we're going to see a lot of, even if it's not the, the the business specifically that changes, the commercial models that will change, and and what we value in a relationship across, you know, in marketing certainly our, our supplier relationships, how we look towards our agency partners and, and other partners uh, across the ecosystem. That's going to be a really interesting moment and I think AI has gone gone from toy to tool it's yeah. kind of this big coming of age that we've had so uh, yeah, exciting moment exciting moment indeed right let's take some questions from the audience we've got about we've got about 17 minutes by my watch and we'll take the first question from the audience remember what I said about Forrest and hands <laughs> <laughs> gentleman here at the front um, I've got two questions so I'm happy to do one now but later it depends um, so we've we've experimented with with AI <laughs> We've experimented um, with AI in the smart department, playing around with like images and content, etc. Um, it doesn't always come back, particularly on the content front, unless you point it at a particular trusted source, it doesn't always come back. So I spend half my time looking at it, half my time actually checking, it hasn't lied to me. Yeah. Fear, thing. So for you guys, I suppose, for it being massively adopted, Unless people understand how to point it at stuff, how do we guarantee that what it actually gives us is going to be something we can stand up for and boss it and quote all the media without it? Yeah. Fortified? I mean, hallucinations are definitely a, um, a challenge and they're being overcome in different, different ways and different models and different tools. I you can best speak to what we're doing at Microsoft with, for example, New Bing. And that is working really hard to reference. So where it makes uh, comments, it references its source. So instead of having to really dig uh, for it, you click that, you go, where's the source? If I see this, do I think that's a reputable source? Not all sources are, are created equal. Uh, getting something about marketing from Sim versus some unknown blogger is, is going to have obviously more merit. Uh, and that's one way we're trying to solve it. We'll continue to evolve on that. I think we're working on on ways we do referencing and, and showing. And I think as we get more plugins and data sets, that's also going to be a big moment of this. If you know you're plugging into, say, a proprietary data set within, you know, in SIM or in within your own organization, high, high level of trust in that. You don't have to worry. If you're doing it from the open web and, and scraping, then you have to be much more judicious, judicious about you know, how you validate that before you take any action. Interesting. There's a lady at the back with a long dark hair. Oh, you've both got long dark hair. <laughs> <laughs> you, you first, and we'll go for you, you, you after, madam. Yeah. Hi there, um, I'm Therese. Um, I'm currently using ChatGPT, um, Bing Chat, and Google Bard mostly to help me with copywriting. Um, usually just put, inputting some information and then, and then massaging it afterwards so that it is still my own work. Um, what are the other top tools? Sorry, I also use um, generative film in Photoshop, um, which I'm loving. Uh, what are the other hottest marketing tools that you guys are aware of that uh, are not yet on my radar? I'll come to you first, Vincent. Okay. Yeah. So, um, first, the cold shower. There are about 10,000 tools and about 100 every day because it's so easy to create them. But they are dominant tools, right? So you're right, ChatGPT, you can't get wrong with that. Um, Bard also. I, I use, in fact, I use them to cross-check back to the issue of hallucination uh, the output, like what, what, does he, what does this one say when this one say that, right? So I use them to... Uh, um, the one which I find very useful is uh, Claude from uh, Entropic because it has 100,000 tokens context, which means you can feed uh, the entire Wikipedia, or not Wikipedia, but uh, Shakespeare uh, uh, books and uh, your documentation will uh, easily go into the, the context. Uh, which means you can have real conversations because it can connect the dots 
that ChatGPT can't do right now because ChatGPT is limited to 4,000 tokens and now 16,000 if you use GPT 3.5, a bit more, but it's not enough to get a full picture when you have complex subjects uh, to, to address. So that will be an, another tool to look at. In the world of images, of course, you've heard about Midjourney. Uh, the equivalent, which is safe, is Adobe Firefly. Uh, Adobe Firefly guarantee protection against uh, any um, I IP issues because they've used their own training data. So in the world of creation, I would look at uh, Adobe Firefly. Uh, in the world of video, if you're into that space, uh, you, you, I would start with animation type video and Kyber, K-A-I-B-E-R, is, is, is a good tool to create animation on the fly. You take uh, a source picture, you describe where you want your picture to go, and, and you will get the full animation from that starting point to the end points. Um, in the world of text to video, you have Runway ML, which can take a text uh, as an input and convert this into a video of like 12 seconds, not yet ready for prime time. Um, and this is generative AI. So already you have text, you have image, you have pictures, okay? Within ChatGPT, you have plugins. If you don't know data science, but you want to uh, interrogate your data, you can use the code interpreter plugin, which means you can talk uh, with ChatGPT in natural language. Explain to me my GA4 uh, analytics. Give me the insight. Give me uh, this, the most, most important information from, from my traffic. So plugins within ChatGPT, and this one in particular, would be super useful. Um, and this is the world of generative AI. Then you have the world of discriminative AI, which is how to use your data to predict behaviors, to cluster audiences. In that space, uh, I believe that Microsoft is doing interesting thing with Azure. I use a tool called DataIQ, which is a visual, no code, and uh, I can build prediction model in five minutes with that tool. Um, so when you combine this uh, discriminative AI and generative AI dominant tools, you have the perfect uh, arsenal here to uh, do whatever you want. Yeah. Right, I mean, door. what, what do I door. add to that? I think that was a, a pretty comprehensive uh, encyclopedia uh, <laughs> of the tools. Just ask ChatGPT. No, you yeah. can't because it's going to hallucinate. Yeah. <laughs> as a thing. <laughs> as a thing. Lady in the black dress. You, you madam. Yeah. Hello. Um, it sounds like from the conversation today that one of the kind of key facts in the success of AI is its application and, more importantly, its responsible application. Do you think, as marketers, we have a responsibility to educate our businesses as well as individually upskilling about how to responsibly use AI? Mm, good question. Is it our responsibility to educate above us? Do you know what? I, I, my personal view is it's everyone who sees the value in these tools to A, use them responsibly, and then B, advocate for that and, and demonstrate that responsibility and educate those that are, that are earlier on in that, that journey. And I, yeah, I think for the most part, you, you see that happening and, and there's going to be early adopters and there's going to be laggards and yeah, that, that, that adoption curve has been there and it's pretty pervasive for a long time. That will continue to persist. So I think by demonstrating how it can be responsibly used, it's also going to accelerate adoption of those that are maybe a little bit more reluctant to take, take it on. I think there's obviously a big concern in business around data. Uh, privacy should be a huge concern there, and that's yeah. How is the model that you're using being built? What data? You know, so knowing your source. I don't think it's going to be good enough uh, as as legislation and regulation picks up to say, oh, I didn't know that's how it's done. You have to interrogate what tool you're going to use and and why it is the right one or the safe one. Uh, that's where you know if you're talking about um, some of the tools that we provide, obviously. You know, we're doing some of that work. Adobe's doing great things with Firefly there as well and kind of, I guess, to an extent, indemnifying. Um, but yeah, going off and using some of these startup ones, you've got to be careful. And so that start there and then just educating, again, practicing all those kind of things and sharing what doesn't work so you know the, the, the right paths to go. <coughs> uh, <laughs> this is a controversial subject, this one. <laughs> Because I, I believe that uh, the C-suite the, the, will have a responsibility to choose the right model and therefore to understand what is a model and understand the constitutional principle behind the models. And some companies do reveal their constitutional principles, i.e. how they want the machine to, how do they want the AI to uh, behave. And some other companies don't. Mm. And some companies lie about this and some companies don't. So you will have to be educated to make the right large language model choice if you want to act responsibly. 
which means you need to uh, yeah, learn that, how that's how, that sounds quite a lot to ask of marketers that they, they understand they understand how the algorithms work. No, no, no. The decision to use a model should be made by the IT department or whatever. Right. In in the with the insight of how that model has been built and which data has been used for training, right? And then the application, then you can close your eyes and, and, and rely on your on your partner, on your colleagues for, for making the right choices, right? But the organization, when I, when I, the organization needs to be aware of that, right? So that it cascades responsibly down to the marketers, is my point. Do you think IT procurement teams generally are aware of how these things are built? Some of them are, some of them aren't. BT is very well aware, but I would not comment for uh, everyone. Um, just reading the news, you know, is a good uh, signal to see uh, where this is going and what you can trust and what you can't. Um, yeah. Interesting. Another question. Can I ask then, just building on that question, most of what people are seeing about AI at the moment is that in two years' time, which seems to be this, this timeline, AI is going to kill off the human race, basically. <laughs> And that's what most people, unfortunately, are seeing at the moment. How, as sort of professionals, can we navigate through that and have a sensible conversation about some of the things that you've talked about it bringing to us that has add positivity to things, rather than this constant fear that we're going to turn into sort of a Terminator-type scenario? I think it's a great question, just briefly, because I think, although I mentioned fear amongst marketers, I think fear amongst marketers is much lower as a, as a proportion of the marketing profession, mm -hmm. or, uh, of that profession, as it is of the society at large. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think many marketers actually have a lot of positives in it. There is some fear, but it's generally seen as positive. But it's possibly true, this lady says, that as a society at large, it is seen as a bit Terminator too. It is seen as a bit of a, a, a threat that is going to cause us major problems. How can we, as marketers, maybe show the positive side? Well, I'm going to start with you. I, I find that one of the most powerful ways to, to tell is to show, right? And where we, we see it less of a scenario where it takes over from us and we keep, we keep demonstrating where it, it augments our capabilities, it enables us, it empowers us, is, is a really great way to show, and obviously, a fear around what it does do to jobs and, and some sectors that might be uh, different to others, but as we continue to find the applications and um, lower the, the hurdle towards understanding it and getting people to, to play with it um, is going to help some way. But I think yeah, it's an incredibly, incredibly complex topic from, from a, a range of views, be it political, societal, um, commercial. I'm sure this has a, a much deeper uh, point of view from the... the Technology specifically and, and how that Deeper, plays. I don't out. know. Just just to come back on the two years figure, right? It's not coming from nowhere. It's coming from Gartner, magic um, Gartner, the um, inflation curve. You know where it's. So on that curve, you can see that machine learning, which has been around for years, is almost at the plateau, and generative AI is at the peak of inflation. And it takes about a couple of years to go to a plateau. So it's a question of time. Within two years, we will forget about this uh, fear because it's going to be so embedded in whatever we do and whatever we use, it's going to be in the car, it's going to be in the fridge, it's going to be uh, in your TV, it's going to be everywhere. And it's going to, it's going to act kindly. That's, that's what people kind of uh, witness after using this generative AI a lot, the kindness of it. Um, that's, it's going to become uh, normal. And so we will forget this moment of fear um, that we should not incentivize uh, by also not looking at the wrong people, right? So, of course, if we follow uh, that YouTube influencer and that Twitter account and so on that keep repeating these messages, we just encourage these, these people uh, to communicate this, and most of the time with an agenda. The agenda being uh, to accelerate regulation of the industry and to uh, build watered garden so that some companies emerge winners from this and some others lose. So there is an agenda that uh, is manipulative, and by not focusing on uh, the people that convey this agenda, we also solve the problem. The third one is education, really. And again, thanks for the CIM to, for, for, for CIM to, um, to start this, this journey. Uh, because if people don't understand how AI works and the fact that AI is not intelligence, AI is just patterns and connections, um, then, then, then they will 
at this point, when they understand that, that they understand there is no risk for humanity. Do you think there's a problem with the naming? Do you think, do you think it got named badly because you've said that artificial intelligence is not intelligent? I think you're right. Yeah. I think it should not be called uh, intelligence, it should, should be called something else. You yeah. might want to blame Hollywood for a lot of that as Absolutely. well. I mean, there's Terminator. I turned on I, I Robot earlier in the week, and that was a bad move, wasn't it? Like, when you talk <laughs> about all this, maybe don't put it into robotics. Yeah. <laughs> Seems to be what the directors are telling us. So, and in fact, just to finish on that, think about one movie in science fiction that was positive about AI. I see none. Zero, no. nada. They are all negative. Yeah. It's all about uh, how the humanity is going to disappear and uh, the, whether the Matrix, Terminator, or whatever. None of these uh, filmmakers had a positive light. When you look at the reality, every time I talk about AI or, use, or look at people using AI, I see positivity. I see happiness. I see liberation, you know? <laughs> so where, where is this in the media? Nowhere. Mm. It's our job as marketer to show the, 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 the nice picture, but also the, the reality of, of AI, which is, is not completely... Uh, Maybe we need to let it write a, a movie about itself, do its own script writing, <laughs> that's, see that's, what it comes that's up. That's a bit of personal come. PR. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's why they strike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We've got, uh, amazingly, we're almost at the end of our hour. I've got time for one, possibly two questions if they're quick. I'll take one more from the audience. Lady here with Pat. So I specialise in SEO for the equine sector, which is very traditional, um, and even getting them to understand why they need SEO in the first place, people like pulling teeth. Um, and when I've tried to use AI, for example, for copywriting, there just isn't, I know it uses data that's already available on the internet, and there just isn't enough accurate specialist information available for it to do a good job of it. Um, but at the same time, I'm worried that search engines and, and the internet in general are kind of going in a direction where actually these businesses are going to need AI, and then they're going to need to be able to use it in order to be able to still use search engine optimization. So at what point are these niche sectors going to be able to actually utilise the AI technology? Because at the moment, I feel like they're going to need it, but the tools that I've used are just not, they, they, they're just not accurate enough. Mm. And the equine sector is one example of many, one machine. Yeah. There's a quite a niche sector where there just isn't the wealth of information or data for it to work for. Yeah, it... <laughs> It, it's definitely a challenge. I, I think, as, as Vincent's made the point of saying, you know, it, it's not actually intelligent. It, it's got to build from something, and if it's not there to build from, then it can't draw on it to give you a, a, a response in kind. Look, search is changing, I think, in amazing ways, but very, very rapidly. Um, and that experience now with chat, what it means for publishers of content, how they will monetize from that, or how they will, uh, what the audience experience will be like. We know it's going in the right direction that the audience is getting a richer experience, for sure. I, you know, I come back to that stat about 10 billion queries and about 50% of them not getting the answer people are looking for. So I think that's amazing. And then as marketers, you know, SEO has been foundational to search for, for a long, long time now. I'm sure you have a huge amount of expertise in your, your niche. I think this is where data sets become really, really important. And again, where the opportunity comes, if it's not there... Maybe it's an opportunity to create something. You know, how could you use the tool to impart your wisdom and knowledge into the other SEO kind of tools? It obviously understands the principles, but lacks the specific data set to build on it. You know, someone is going to grab that niche and develop for it. And that's the kind of opportunity I think you get excited about. That's the power of this. Maybe that would be hard to do before. Now you could scale your knowledge and expertise very, very quickly to many kind of businesses in that sector, maybe others as well what you were saying earlier about make sure you occupy the space final word to you Vincent. one tip and one idea tip one the large language model how they find out about your website easily or in an easier way is if your website uh, also show the content in a format called JSON-LD so you can ask ChatGPT how can I create JSON-LD data items on my website so that I'm discovered by the large language model and you will be able to implement this on your website. Only 40% of websites in the world do that, right? Um, second, the idea is, is it about SEO? Yeah. Or is it about the experience that you want to convey to your users that will make them stick and talk about your website and so on? In that case, it seems like the trend is becoming, becoming about conversational AI on your website. 
i.e. it's not just a dumb chatbot, it's an avatar that actually talks with your user and make the experience uh, of visiting your website so amazing that they talk about it to others, right? So that's the new SEO, in fact. And so if you struggle with SEO right now, tip one, look at this JSON LD format so you are being discovered by the, the model. So when people ask questions about your domain, your name comes first. Second, think about the experience and think about looking at how you could adapt your own ChatGPT on your own website with your own data and so on. Thank you very much. I mean, this has been absolutely enlightening and fantastic. I've enjoyed it very much. I hope you all have all enjoyed it very much indeed. And I hope we'll get you together again on the podcast, both of you, because sure. it's fantastic. And actually, Ben, I've asked some questions. You're going to go for a drink now and maybe get some more questions to these gentlemen, if you can, before they go. I'm afraid the time's up. I promised the events team I wouldn't overrun, and I've overrun by three minutes, which is, I don't know what's going to happen to me. <laughs> so um, before we go, though, just want to say a big thank you to Mr. Vincent Sider and you. Mr. Ryan Miles for what has been a fantastic, fantastic discussion today. Thank you, thank, you very much. thank you very much, gentlemen, for being on the show and rounding off this season of the podcast in a brilliant manner, um, the feature-length episode. Um, I should say we'll be back in September for those people listening at home for the fifth season of the CIM Marketing Podcast. We may, of course, have these gentlemen on next season or, in, or, even, or later, but we'll definitely have you on again. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to the CIM Marketing Podcast on your platform of choice. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating and review. We'd love to hear your feedback.